Well, thank you for, for joining us today. I'm Richard Gingras uh, with our uh, eminent guest, uh, Marty Barron. Uh, so thank you for joining us, those here and, and on the GVC. Um, Marty Barron, I think you probably all know to some extent. I'll just give you a little bit more background. And I didn't dig up anything interesting is the truth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in my repertorial abilities in that regard. Um, Marty's basically spent his career in the newspaper business. He's worked for basically all the major national papers in the United States. He worked for the LA Times, Boston Globe, Washington Post, New York Times, Miami Herald. Um, you were editor of the Miami Herald. That was your first editor gig, was the Miami Herald. Uh, then Marty went on to the Boston Globe from, what was it, 2002 to? 2001. Well, yeah. 2001 to 2012. Um, where, among other things that were accomplished at the Globe, was the uh, the large expose of uh, uh, um, sex abuse in the Catholic Church of the Archdiocese of Boston, uh, which the Globe uh, obviously led and won Pulitzer's for, and and and, and got you to the point of, of being portrayed by Lee Schreiber in the movie Spotlight. So, congratulations on that. You've, Thanks. You've, Thanks. You've dined off that one a bit, I'm sure, the last two years. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it when people think of him instead of, they, his image comes up instead of mine when they hear my name. It's all right. He's, you know, better looking, more fit, and, uh, you know, that's, that's fine if they think of him. So. When I meet at the Post, I often refer to him as leave and not Marty, just to stump things a bit. Um, and then, of course, came to the Post in 2012. Um, so it's, a, it's obviously been a great run, and, and uh, I would suggest, in fact, you admitted to me this recently, that um, the current administration is likely the most fascinating story you will have covered in your career. Um, so I, I, I personally was not going to load this up with political questions, um, but I did have one, and I'm sure others might have others. Um, Obviously, th this administration seems to be different in more ways than anyone can get comfortable with, um, uh, whether it be uh, uh, Trump's ability to go direct to the people via, via Twitter, um, um, his uh, significant attacks of the fourth estate, so on and so forth. Um, now, I know you've said that, uh, um, you know, your, your answer to this is you just do more hard work, is do more hard reporting. Um, but on the other hand, it, this is a different environment, and, and, and how has it changed, if it has changed, some of the approaches that you take in, in, in reporting stories? Do you guide your reporters in a different way on this story? Well, no. I mean, I think that we rely on the same approaches that we've that we've always had, and that is uh, that you know I think at, at the core of our profession is the process of verification. We have to find out what the real, what the facts are, what the truth is, and present them in an honest, honorable, fair, and accurate way. And also, I believe an unflinching way, uh, tell people directly and straightforwardly what we've what we found. I mean, this is an administration that has uh, sought to. Uh, discredit the press, to marginalize the press, uh, to delegitimize the press, uh, and I think even to dehumanize the press uh, with the language of calling us scum and garbage and uh, the lowest form of humanity. And when that wasn't enough, he said the lowest form of life. Um, and I, I thought he had reached the limit there, but then he came out with the enemy of the American people. So uh, I don't know what's next after that one. But um, uh, you know, I think that that's a strategy. To, to try to uh, position as, us as not being an independent arbiter of facts and truth, but uh, to position us as a political opponent, uh, not just an opponent of him, and, uh, but an opponent of the American people. Um, I think that's dangerous territory. That's, danger that's the kind of territory that uh, authoritarians have uh, typically traveled. Um, and I don't think it's helpful to anybody. What is our response? Our response is to keep doing our jobs, to try to do them as the way that they're supposed to be done, and, uh, and continue to uh, give the public the facts that we feel they need and deserve to know, 
Uh, and then uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, the American people have to make those kinds of decisions. But we did that last week with our, uh, our look at uh, General Flynn, the national security advisor. Uh, we disclosed that uh, he had not told the truth to the American public, and nor to the vice president, uh, when he said that he had never discussed uh, the potential lifting of sanctions with the uh, Russian ambassador to the United States. Uh, we had nine, intel we had nine uh, sources on that, uh, on that story. Uh, and we published the story, and initially he had actually denied to us. When we first talked to him, he denied flatly that he had had such a discussion, and then uh, we waited a day, and on the next day, his spokesman said he'd like to revise his statement. Uh, he'd like to say that he doesn't remember whether it came up. So um, uh, then, we pu then we published, and it led to his uh, his departure from the administration, which at first was described as a resignation and then was described as a firing. Uh, and then the president said, after, after uh, the president's spokesman said that he was fired, uh, the president himself said that the media had treated him unfairly. Now, how you reconcile our treating him unfairly with the fact that he was fired by the president, uh, I don't know. Uh, but um, somehow they, yeah. they say that. Well, you know, interestingly, uh, I mean, in a sense, the the attacks that he's making are are, are beating a uh, a very wounded horse, as it were. I mean, you you've you've made a point of 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 saying that the the biggest challenge facing news organizations today isn't the disruption of the internet, isn't the ability to monetize news um, as as challenging and important as those questions are, that it's that it's really the decline of trust. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so given that, and, and I know you're, you've, you've been deeply involved in this, you've uh, agreed to join the Trust Project effort, which is superb, but uh, what do you think is the answer? Uh, I think ultimately the answer is for us to continue doing our job the way that it's supposed to be done. I, don't, I know what the answer is not, and that is that it's not our job to pander to any particular group, uh, because we think that that's our constituency, and it's not our job to placate any group because we're under attack from them. Uh, I think that we have to be independent. Um, I don't think that being independent is a hostile act, uh, as the administration portrays it. It's not an act of war. Uh, I've said before, we're, we're not at, at war with the administration. We're at work uh, doing our jobs. And you know, pop, the, certainly the, the press has suffered a decline in, in confidence. That's true of pretty much all major institutions except the military in the United States. But we've taken a, particularly hit, a particular hit, and particularly among Republicans, over the last two years when we've been under severe attack uh, from Donald Trump. Uh, but I think that, but you look back in history, the press was under attack uh, during the Watergate investigation. <laughs> uh, and uh, at that time, uh, there was actually an ACLU report at the time that said the press had gone from a position of extreme security to extreme vulnerability. Uh, and they were very concerned about the future of the press in that environment when it was coming under attack from the Nixon, Nixon administration. Uh, well, it turned out that the investigation of the administration, of course, led by the Washington Post, um, in the Watergate investigation, turned out to be true. Uh, there turned out to be all sorts of bad things happening in that administration, and ultimately uh, Nixon had to leave office. And confidence in the press soared to mm -hmm. record levels after that, after that work. Uh, so I think there, is, there are rewards for us in just doing our jobs uh, and sticking to our central purpose, uh, and that's what certainly we at the Washington Post intend to do. So, Let's probe into that, and, and, and you're right. I mean, the, at least in the United States history, uh, trust in the press hit pretty much an all-time high around Watergate, um, but has been declining pretty steadily since then. And it didn't. It, I mean, interestingly, it didn't <coughs> drop off a cliff with the internet. It didn't drop off a cliff two years ago. It's it's been on a, a pretty steady decline. Um, and I appreciate you saying you say we just need to do our work. I guess the question I would pose is, do people understand your work? Do they understand how you approach your work? Um, and, and is there opportunity to do things differently in that regard? Well, I don't think people understand our work. I mean, we have a whole generation, maybe multiple generations of people who've grown up essentially not reading a newspaper, not reading uh, or um, turning to other sources of information rather than those of us who are in what is sometimes derisively called the MSM or the mainstream, mainstream media. 
Uh, and so I don't think, pe think people have an understanding of uh, how, how hard it is to, to do our work, how much time it takes. I mean, we can't just go out and, forgive me, Google the information, all the information that we publish. Uh, it's not there. I mean, Bob Woodward of Watergate fame talks about how he spoke to a class at a very prominent university uh, once and said, how would you do Watergate now? And people said they would go Google uh, the information. Well, that information that wasn't available on Google until they, they unearthed it. And so um, I don't think people understand just how difficult it is to do this because now so much information is available instant, instantly uh, thanks to companies like this one, uh, primarily company like this one. So, uh, but to sort of unearth information takes a lot more work. And, um, and I think that is a problem. And I, I don't, I, I, I worry about people not understanding just how much effort really go, needs to go into this. Now, how should we change? Uh, as we've discussed on any number of occasions as part of this trust project, we probably need to show more of our work uh, to people, uh, show the original documents, talk about a little bit more about who we spoke to, uh, almost in a footnotey kind of, footnote kind of way. Uh, that takes time. Uh, it's, Typically not, we haven't invested in doing, in doing that sort of thing. We've certainly become more accustomed these days to putting original documents up, to annotating those documents, things like that. Uh, but I would say that it's a small uh, portion of the work that we do, and it probably needs to be a greater portion of the work that we do, that we as news organizations need to be more transparent. Uh, now, that's difficult to do that in all circumstances. So you take the uh, investigation of General Flynn, for example. <laughs> Uh, those were nine confidential sources, uh, and nobody there is going to go on the record to tell you who they are, uh, and we're not putting it on the record because that was the basis of our agreement, uh, and, um, and that's how we were able to obtain the story, uh, and it's all true. Uh, but, um, but in other circumstances, I do think that we have a, a greater freedom and a greater necessity of, of, of showing our work more fully. So let's go a, a, a little bit beyond that, um, you know, because it, it certainly has been my sense that given the dramatically different ecosystem that we're in, uh, uh, the, the, the massively larger ecosystem of sources of content that might be news, might not be news, and I don't mean that in a fake news sense, there's, you know, there's Joe Blogger and there's the Washington Post. Um, you know, vastly different environment, people consume information, form opinions in different ways, which to me says, uh, you know, does, does, does journalism in its form and substance and approach uh, need to rethink itself given this different context? And I mean, in a sense, more dramatically, because one of the things I look at, and I see you get, you get all of those, you get Joe's blog, you've got, um, you've got a news outlet that might be known to be leaning left and another known, known to be leaning right. Um, and I go even to an individual publication, say like The Post, and, and uh, I see your fact-based coverage, and I see opinion columns, and I see the editorial page. These are a lot of mixed messages. Uh, you know, I mean, is it, are we at a time and place when we need to get even more structured and rigorous in what a um, credible, respected news institution can or should be? Not that everyone will follow that, but someone needs to start. Well, we're beginning to do that. As you know, we've started uh, labeling pieces more uh, as opinion or analysis or a review or something like that to distinguish them from, from news. Uh, and this became ever more urgent as so much of our work is appearing on a lot of different platforms. And even if we were to have labeling, let's say, in the newspaper, it didn't become apparent. It wasn't visible on all these other platforms uh, where we were appearing. Uh, so, you know, not just on Google, but on, let's say, Apple News or on Twitter or on Facebook or uh, Snapchat or wherever we are, and we're, in, we're pretty much everywhere. Uh, and that's our desire to be pretty much everywhere, is to make sure that these labels actually travel with the story and are visible regardless of where they're appearing. Uh, and so we've worked very hard to do that. So that provides some level of structure. I'm not suggesting that that's the total answer, but, um, but it's one step in the process. So what role can and should schools play in empowering students to uh, be media literate? And what does that me media literate even mean when it gets, when you go to a middle school or a high school? Right, 
Uh, well, that's a subject of great interest to me. I'm <clears throat> involved in an informal way with uh, something called the News Literacy Project. Uh, and there are others, but that is uh, a prominent one and one which I, uh, I, I have a great belief in their, in their <coughs> mission and the way that they're going about their work. Uh, and that is to help uh, students really understand how to be more critical judges of the information that they're receiving, to ask the right questions. Uh, and that's all we can really expect is that people ask the questions and try to get, try to get answers to those questions. And to sort of question the, the sources that they have and what is the documentation that they have, what is the basis for saying that, are they providing actual evidence, uh, things, of that, things of that sort. So uh, they've now, they're starting to scale up. They have online uh, tutorials. Uh, they're making those available to teachers uh, throughout, uh, at schools throughout the country. Uh, fortunately, they've been able to get some additional foundation support uh, to do that. But boy, is that a long process uh, and a difficult process and a process that doesn't have any certain results. Uh, we'll have to see how that works. Uh, I'm concerned about what's happening uh, it more immediately, and how do we how do we deal with that? Now, to that, I'm I'm concerned about it, but I don't really have any answers to it, unfortunately. I think that's a real. Uh, we're hoping that maybe Google can figure out working with us to figure out how to sort out uh, fact from fiction uh, and to um, uh, give more visibility to things that are fact based as opposed to those that are are not that are outright falsehoods. It's tricky, tricky territory, uh, no question. We were having a discussion earlier today about that. Uh, it is not, not easy to do, especially when you're considering free speech issues and things of that sort. So, um, but it's a, it's a worthy cause. Uh, but certainly, uh, we do have to think long run, and we do have to think about what's being taught in middle schools and high schools, colleges as well, and maybe for adults, um, and uh, is how to be more critical to critical evaluators of the information that they're receiving. So you're, I mean, you're, you're sitting here in the home of Google search. Um, so, I mean, what would you suggest that we do in this regard from our, you know, from our product experiences? Uh, give greater prominence to the Washington Post. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, look, I mean, that obviously that's just. Uh, joke, uh, but um, I, I and it's not the first. Uh, although, time feel that free joke to follow my advice. Feel, feel, feel Ezra free Ezra Klein, to. Ezra Klein, your buddy. Uh, well, he recommended the Washington Post too. I <laughs> he hope, said so. the only reason he was here was he felt it would get him more Google juice. I see. Okay. <laughs> good for good for Ezra. So, um, um, in any event, so um, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, I th I think that we. We've talked about being more transparent, that that should help. Uh, perhaps that could actually elevate us in the, in the world of, of Google search. Uh, more uh, information about the writers, who they are, uh, how they can be contacted, um, uh, things of that sort uh, being, being available to people. Uh, perhaps uh, greater uh, weight given to people who are actually in the region. So why shouldn't, uh, let's say if the Washington Post has a correspondent in Iraq who's putting his or her life at risk to cover what's happening there and is actually providing information back to the, back to the, the American public and the public throughout the world, uh, perhaps be given a bit more authority than someone who's sitting in a television studio, uh, who's never left the comfort of a television studio and is not witnessing anything firsthand. Uh, so now how you do that, uh, it's hard to do, uh, hard to evaluate because Anybody can put a dateline that says they're from somewhere, uh, and they may or may not actually be there. Uh, there are very few news organizations, relatively few news organizations, that actually have people in conflict zones as we do. Uh, but, but that could be a, that could be a means for, um, you know, for sort of giving greater weight uh, because there should be greater trust for people who actually are eyewitnesses to events. Right. What's your opinion on these third-party fact-checking organizations and the approach that Facebook has taken, for example, in trying to kind of farm out, I guess, Yeah, the what Facebook is doing, yeah. right. Well, we were invited to be part of that. Uh, we decided to wait and see how it goes. We have a very substantial fact-checking organization. We actually just yesterday posted every fact-check on Donald Trump in the, at the, since, in the four weeks since he took office. Uh, there are a lot of fact-checks. Uh, so, um, so, um, 
You know, I mean, I think it's interesting. Uh, they obviously want to do something. Uh, I'm all in favor of people doing something. Um, readers are able to sort of tag things and say this should be checked. Uh, and then that gets farmed out to the fact-checking organizations, and they decide whether they're going to pick that up. And uh, if they do, then uh, and they question the veracity of, uh, of a story, uh, then uh, that gets flagged and flagged in some way. I don't think it covers a lot of stories out there, so I think it's going to get a very small percentage of of, uh, of the falsehoods that are that are floating out there. Uh, but it's a step. Uh, we'll see how it goes to see whether we would participate. We're a little bit different from these independent fact-checking organizations because we're actual we're an actual news organization, um, and uh, I think we. I mean, it's interesting, as is often the case, I mean, this is just a grievance from people in the news organization, is we would make all the investment, we would do all the work, we would do the risk of being targeted because of the fact check that we did, um, and outfits like Facebook would not suffer. They would then not do any of the work, not make any of the investment, um, but would be able to say that they did something about this problem. Uh, now, I don't know that there's another answer for them, uh, so I'm in favor of anything that we can do that uh, draws attention to falsehoods, but it's only going to get a small, uh, small. It's only going to reach a small portion of the problem. Another question from a Googler: um, What are your thoughts on the future of long-form and investigative journalism, given the increasing torrent of content and decreasing attention spans? Who will fund it, and who demographically will consume it? Uh, I actually think it's pretty good. Uh, I think there's actually an increased interest in investigative reporting. Um, certainly, I'm, I'm hopeful that the, the movie about the Spotlight Team's investigation of the Catholic Church created interest in, a, in the general population, and I've seen a lot of interest in what we did. But more importantly, I think what's happened in, during the election and subsequent to the election is that there is a appropriate demand on major news organizations like ours uh, to do investigative reporting, and also for there to be investigative reporting by regional news organizations as well. Uh, I think that that is, I happen to think that that's absolutely core to our mission uh, that, we, that we have as our central purpose uh, and our highest purpose, holding powerful institutions and powerful individuals accountable. Uh, and certainly that includes the President of the United States who holds the top position in the most powerful country on earth. So, uh, but we should be doing that across for politicians and policymakers and other powerful institutions that are out there. So there's, an, I think, an increasing expectation on the part that news organizations should be doing that work and an increasing willingness, willingness on the part of people to actually pay for that. And we're seeing that in, in a surge of subscriptions to the Washington Post. Um, and other news organizations are seeing that as well. The New York Times has reported the, the same thing. And these are people who say, I want you to do this kind of work. I am willing to support you to do this kind of work. In fact, I think it's important that I support you to do this sort of work, uh, because otherwise, it's not going to get done. And the truth is, it's not going to get done unless people support news organizations that do it. Um, and, and so uh, we do see that that kind of reporting, that in-depth reporting uh, that's investigative uh, is well read across the spectrum by people of all age groups and all, all demographic groups. And that is, that is really encouraging. And it gets shared uh, dramatically you know, through social networks and has a very, powerful, a very powerful effect. But it is very expensive. It's incredibly expensive to do. It takes a lot of time. Uh, we, we're, in a, we're in an environment and a, and a time where people expect that they can get information instantly, no matter what, on about any subject. Thanks to you guys, um, and uh, and the truth is, and the truth is that is not possible. Not all information can be obtained instantly. There actually is work that goes into obtaining that information, and so I think people have to have an appreciation for how much time, how much effort, how much energy really needs to go into into doing investigative work, uh, and understand that it takes it takes resources, mm -hmm. including money, to do that. Um, and uh, but I do think that there is a surge of interest in investigative reporting uh, and an increased expectation that, expectation that news organizations like ours uh, will do that and do it consistently. How carefully do you study uh, consumption patterns of your readers, uh, uh, including to the point of do they read the full article? How do you assess that? What's your, what are you learning? 
Uh, we do. We do assess. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of. We have a tremendous amount of data. We have a tremendous technology team, which works with uh, closely with Google, uh, and we have a lot of data about consumption patterns. In fact, it's up on a board in the center of our newsroom. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the traffic, uh, but also uh, the speed of a site. Very important. Um, the um, uh, how how deeply people are scrolling into stories on average, and we also look at that. Uh, across individual stories. In fact, we're developing or have developed a new metric, which we'll, we'll continue to develop, to sort of judge the value of stories. And one of them is how deeply into stories are people actually reading. So um, it's really important to us. Has that changed significantly over the last few years? Um, and do you see patterns different between mobile consumption and desktop consumption? Uh, you know, I don't know the data on that, but uh, our latest data in terms overall is that uh, people are spending more time on site. So that is a, that's positive. In terms of scroll depth, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. You said earlier um, that uh, there are rewards in just doing our jobs. I'm interested in what that means when the job of journalism is changing so much with digital media and the internet. Well, I think there are all sorts of you know rewards. I mean, look, um, um, there are rewards in terms of how many people uh, uh, are subscribing to us. When we're seeing an increase in subscribers, that's one, uh, and we are. Uh, traffic, uh, we've seen a surge in traffic to the Washington Post. We are well over 100 million unique visitors per month. Uh, we were in November. We actually surpassed the New York Times for domestic traffic in, in November, uh, and that's that shows tremendous progress for us. But then there are, there are other rewards, rewards that, are, um, uh, that are different. Um, and you know, at the time, I was obviously involved in this movie, the spotlight thing. And I wrote a piece. I was, my colleagues demanded that I write a piece about it. So I did write a piece about it. And the whole, the whole premise of the piece was that there are awards, like the Oscars, Fortunately, it won the Oscar for Best Picture, but there are rewards. Uh, there are rewards. Uh, and the rewards were what um, the impact that it had on ordinary people's lives. All right? And uh, it had an enormous impact on people's lives. And uh, you know, I was at a uh, convention of survivors of sexual, clerical sexual abuse uh, last year. And they asked me to be their keynote speaker. And there were, and normally they would have in past years, they would have had very few people there, but they had 300 people attending the convention. And person after person came up to me to tell me that the reason that they showed up for that convention was because of the work that the Boston Globe did uh, and uh, that it made an enormous difference. That and the movie persuaded them to go public uh, with the abuse that they had suffered and to uh, see it as their own personal obligation to hold uh, the church accountable for its behavior. Uh, and not to keep it secret anymore. That's called a reward. And setting aside traffic and subscriptions and monetization models and all that stuff, to me, that's, that's the most important reward. And it's exactly why I'm in this business. I mean, in a sense, w what happened there is this. They, that community saw the globe and that coverage as their advocates. Um, and I mean, interestingly, you tend to shy away from that term in journalism of, of advocacy because it suggests that somehow you're taking a position on things. I actually sometimes wonder whether we shouldn't go in the other direction of, of, of how do you establish that relationship with your community such that they understand that you are advocates for their interests, problems, challenges in the community. Um, I, I, particularly I, given how people perceive the media today, which is basically right. you know, you're, you're just bashing everybody because you like to have fun with it. Yeah, right. Um, we, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that as a, as a profession, as an industry, we've done a terrible job of explaining how we have been ad advocates over the years. I mean, local newspapers all over the place have done incredible work in terms of uh, uh, bringing to light uh, environmental dangers, uh, dangers to public safety, uh, uh, abuse of power, corruption, things like that, uh, whole, across a whole range. We don't tend to, you know, we give ourselves awards, but we don't advertise kind of what we did. We don't have an uh, a, uh, advertising campaign to talk about it. And people tend to start taking that for granted. Uh, and they shouldn't take it for granted, right. because if they take it for granted, it's not going to happen anymore. Uh, and there are 
politicians at the local and state level today who know that there's absolutely nobody paying any attention to what they do. Uh, if you go to state houses across this country, the major newspaper in the state, uh, which is the organization that has the largest, the greatest resources for news coverage, may have only one person in the state house, and that individual is in charge of covering the governor, both houses of the legislature, all state agencies, politics, and policy. And now, if how that person can do one bit of investigative reporting, it's hard to know. Uh, it's, it's impossible to do what they're expected to do and to do it well. Uh, they do it the best they can, but they're completely overloaded. Uh, and so, and we have traditionally, news organizations, particularly so legacy newspapers that aren't just newspapers anymore, um, have done that kind of work uh, and they have not gotten sort of the credit for the work that they, the work that they did. And they have been an advocate for the public. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion that, you know, that, uh, that this, that people in this profession would be described as an enemy of the American people, it so dishonors, uh, not them, just them as individuals, but the work that they have done on, on people's behalf. Um, I can tell you that, let's just take that, you know, the, the church investigation, the sexual abuse investigation, the people who were survivors of sex abuse, they did not view uh, the investigative team of the Boston Globe as an enemy of the American people, as their enemy. They viewed them as their advocate, and they're very grateful that they did the work they did. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned earlier uh, moving towards trying to footnote more and you know, provide source documentation to pro provide more clarity into what went into the, uh, the investigative reporting. Um, to what end, or what, what does that do for you and for the paper in the sense that like, people that don't already I guess understand or believe that what you're do what you've reported is correct. Are they actually going to go and look at the footnote and the source? Can I? I can, I'm going to. Can I jump in on that? Uh, here, to me, here's why I think it matters. Is I, I, you know, it's not whether you look at the footnote. The the comparison I would make is you go read an academic article in an academic journal, right? And you see the peer review and you see all the footnotes and so on. You get a different sense of the amount of seriousness that went into that effort. Right. I think it's just about that. It's not whether I delve into the footnotes, but it, it, does the very presence of the footnotes or artifacts of the effort that went into the story an, an important message in itself? Feel free to disagree. Well, I agree, but it's got to, it's, well, I agree, and Richard's pressing me on this issue. So, uh, uh, but I, I, I think there's merit in it, and I think that, Look, not everybody's going to read every story, and not everybody's going to read every footnote, and that's just the way it is. Not everybody does a lot of things. Uh, but for the people who want to, who feel that they should, then why would we, why would we not make that available? Uh, and if we can, why not, why not do it? Uh, I'll take this occasion to mention that you know, we use annotations on documents, and, um, and so we use Genius, actually. Um, and. Uh, uh, so it's, here's this thing that was created to annotate rap, and we use it to annotate uh, Donald Trump's press conferences. So, uh, <laughs> and, but it doesn't work on Google AMP. Uh, and so you got to work on that. Yeah, we got to work on that. <laughs> it would be really helpful if this thing worked on Google AMP. So noted. OK. Uh, so you, you'd spoken earlier that you guys have incorporated a lot of data. So I wanted to know especially uh, what role that has in affecting like what's being put out on the front page, especially like in our, the editorial department, are you guys as editors uh, drawing a line from like A-B testing to you know, not go towards clickbait and also um, prioritizing news, especially like you know, longer issues that aren't quite sensational anymore, like Fukushima or like Flint or things like that. Like, how are you drawing that balance and how are you prioritizing? Right. Are, are you victims towards marketing and advertising for? Yeah, no, we don't. I mean, our, we make our news decisions based on our editorial judgments and our experience. And look, we have a, we have a brand, uh, we have an identity. Uh, we can't do anything that undermines that brand. If we were to sort of revert to just clickbait, then people would say, well, Washington Post isn't what the Washington Post is. Uh, that is. That is not a successful business strategy for us. We do want to sort of understand um, uh, what, you know, what are the qualities of a story, which ones actually succeeded. We do want to uh, reward people who are producing stories that might actually uh, do well, let's say, in terms of traffic, because 
Um, you know, that's just part of who we are now. We also, I mean, for example, we use data to one of the things that we're doing right now is try to, trying to anticipate which stories are likely to be popular to sort of look at momentum indicators and things like that. And what's the purpose of that? The purpose is, did we build that, out, that story out? We can't always anticipate which story is gonna be popular. Have we built that story out the way that we should? Are there interstitial links in there? Are there other elements? Are, you know, how have we, you know, uh, what's the best way to build that story out so that somebody might actually click on another story? Uh, we also have a big data team, it's not my area, uh, but a big data team that works on uh, the story, the recommended stories after you've read a story. Uh, that They're the ones who come up with the recommended stories uh, based on reading patterns. Uh, and not, it's basically we took the humans out of the picture uh, and um, they use whatever algorithm is it, it is and they present the stories and it's improved our performance. Uh, we actually can anticipate what people want to read better than a human can. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. It's sure. been great. Um, and it's been really encouraging to see how subscriptions have surged at the Post. Um, hiring for investigative journalists has also gone up. And I guess my question is more about you know reaching Trump supporters. Um, you saw John Oliver about two weeks ago. You know He bought add time on Fox to reach Trump and his supporters. And I just was wondering, does the Post, maybe not as blatant, but does the Post have a strategy to kind of reach his supporters um, in the areas where they consume news? Not necessarily on Fox, but just a strategy in general. We don't really have a strategy for, for that. Um, I, I think, I mean, the reality is that there are a lot of Trump supporters who read us, if only to criticize us. So uh, that's OK. Uh, but. Uh, and there are a lot of conservative sites that actually pick up our stories, um, like Drudge is a big driver of traffic, and they pick up our stories all the time, the ones that sort of conform to their particular worldview. Uh, so, you know, they are reading us. Uh, we have a wide variety of opinion people as well, um, and we have, in a very determined way, sought out uh, people who have opinions that are more in line with Trump so that we have a wide variety of opinion. We have people across the spectrum, as, as I think we should. Um, so um, so that's, really what we're, that's really what we're doing. Uh, and we also uh, very systematically and, uh, are talking to Trump supporters to hear their voices. So um, a couple of weeks into the administration, we went out to a rural area, even Maryland, which is generally Democratic, but but it is now, it didn't used to be, but, but the rural Maryland, uh, where it was a center of Trump support uh, to listen to what they had to say, and what they had to say was quite different from uh, what you might hear elsewhere. Uh, in fact, Trump himself read the piece. Uh, he wrote a note to the reporter on, on the story. Uh, somebody must have taken a picture of what he wrote, and then he sent it to the reporter and uh, thanked her for doing the story. Um, I told her, by the way, that autograph's not worth anything unless he sends you the original, uh, the original piece of paper. But, um, um, and then when he did his rally in Florida, uh, we afterwards we talked to the people there and and gave voice to their their point of view, which I think we should. I mean, these are all American citizens who, uh, people who live in the United States who are entitled to have their voices heard, and we should, as a news organization, make sure that we're listening to all voices out there. I read a lot of news, and I consistently read the Washington Post. It's my favorite newspaper, so thank you. It's what? It's, it's a my very... favorite newspaper, so right. thank you. All right. um, I'd love to hear about like how, what is it, that, how is your approach different than other news organizations in the United States? For example, New York Times. What is it that you feel sets your news organization apart? Uh, for one, I think that we, we've we adapted and I should say embraced the web in a way that I think uh, perhaps more quickly and more fully uh, than other news organizations have. Uh, and that uh, extends to, um, I mean, we've always, we've felt that we need to be true to our values and our principles but that the current digital environment requires us to find new forms of expression, to tell stories in different ways. So uh, we have now for years been telling stories that incorporate all the tools that we have today, you know, audio, video, original documents, annotations of documents, interactive graphics, all within the corpus of an individual, individual story. We also tell those stories in a much more conversational way, I think a much more accessible way, where you're not just hearing an institutional voice, but you're getting a, the authentic voice of the, of the author. Uh, I think people now want a sense of authenticity, and I think that that kind of writing style actually is more authentic. 
Um, we paid a lot of attention to our headlines. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, they're written in a much more, um, they're not what I call newspaper headlinees, which has to be squeezed into a defined space, uh, but they, they're intended to get people's attention. Uh, I was in Spain a couple, a few weeks ago, and some of the students there uh, at the university in Pamplona, they said, well, you know, a lot of people now, they'll only read the headlines. How do you get them to read a whole story? And I said, write a good headline, um, and they'll click on the story. But it has, the headline has to be true to the actual substance of the story. Uh, so we've really worked on that. And I think that you are, um, you're now seeing the New York Times begin to change its style of headlines. Uh, you're beginning to see them do stories that, are, that incorporate all the tools that we have that look less like a newspaper story and more like something that's actually native to the web. I think we recognize that um, that uh, the web is its own, it's its own medium uh, in the same way that newspapers were a medium, then radio came along and you didn't just read newspaper stories on radio, and then television came along and you didn't read a radio script on television, and then the web came along and we in the industry, we just put up newspaper stories and we said, aha, we're digital now. Uh, didn't work that way. And then we said, ah, well, let's put them up faster. Well, helped, but it wasn't the answer. And now we're saying, no, there's actually a distinct way of writing and communicating uh, that this new medium has its own idiom as well. Uh, and as has been pointed out to me, it's not just a new medium, it's new mediums. Uh, because now we're having to think about, well, how do we, how do we disseminate news and information on Google Home? Uh, or Amazon Echo or something like that. How do we, what about podcasts, which, have, which at one point died out and now have seen a huge resurgence? It's a different medium. It's not radio, it's different, it's distinct. Uh, what about, okay, when you have some outfit like Snapchat comes along, well, okay, well, what are we doing on Snapchat? And we just started on Snapchat a couple of weeks ago. Um, I hope you all, you know, uh, it's a very different way of telling, is a di different way of telling that story. And so, I think we've done that. I also think that we are just, um, I hope, uh, that, that we're more unflinching in the way that we tell the stories. Uh, that after we've done all this research, uh, that we don't hesitate to just say, this is what we found, this is what we've concluded. Uh, we're not beating around the bush. Uh, we're just gonna tell it to you straight. And uh, I think we do that more than perhaps most. In your mind, is it, I, I, I hear a lot of comments these days of, of you know, there's too much news. Um, uh, I don't have time to consume it. Uh, articles too long. Um, I, I don't know whether these are representative. I just, I, but, but, but these are expressions. Um, um, and I myself aren't sure. I, I, you know, I think one interesting dynamic of the web is in this sort of paradox of numbers, where if everything doesn't get to the hundreds of millions, then somehow it's not working. Whereas Newspapers have been very effective getting the right information into the right heads uh, historically. Uh, what's your take on evolution of form? Um, and you know, there are the Snapchat explorations, and you're just getting started there. But uh, you know, I mean, I think that we just don't know. I mean, I think that people are getting information in all sorts of different ways now. It's a real challenge for those of us who are in the business. We're finding, first of all, people don't want to go look for news. Yeah. They want the news to find them. They don't want to have to go find the news. And so that's, what's that's a lot of what's happening right now. We, uh, I mean, an area, it's kind of an old fashioned way of delivering news, but we have email newsletters which are incredibly effective. People sign up for these newsletters, they end up in their inbox, and uh, if they're done well, they're very, very attractive to people. And they, we, get a lot of, we get a lot of traffic out of that. And we like it, frankly, because it's direct to the reader, mm -hmm. and we don't have to go through an intermediary, not even, not even, not even us. So, yeah. um, and so that's kind of nice. Uh, but also video is becoming incredibly important. Uh, people seem drawn to getting information off of video, so explanatory videos. Uh, we're doing a lot of them, just as you know, as her client at Vox is doing those sorts of things. Animations, you name it, two-minute videos that help explain complex subjects. Uh, with Snapchat, you know, we're take, taking stories that we've already done and breaking them down into this, their essence uh, and then presenting those in a, in a sort of a Snapchat-y kind of way. Um, and uh, whatever that is. And, um, and uh, you know, we just started, so we'll see if it's working. They, uh, they liked what we presented uh, as our proposal. Uh, they said it was the fastest onboarding they've done for any organization uh, ever. And uh, we'll see how it works. And so 
Uh, we just recognize that people are getting information in all sorts of different ways, and we want to be everywhere they are, and we will adapt. Uh, they don't have to, we're not expecting people to, well, here we are, the Washington Post, you're just going to have to come to us and adapt to us, who we are. And if you don't, then we're going to scold you. That's not our view. Uh, and say, you're not, you know, you're not performing your duty as an American citizen or something like that. Our view is that people want to get information in lots of different ways, and we will adapt to the ways that they want to get information while still staying true to our values and our principles. Are you tr I, play, I, I can recall a while back, I was talking to folks at ProPublica, and one of the things they did with their investigative journalism pieces was, which I thought was kind of clever, was, was they basically said, all right, there's a 3,500-word you know, piece here, a 8,000-word piece. Uh, they would basically chunk it out. They almost memified it. And they would do like a series of tweets, a series of social posts. Uh, the whole point being, can I use every one to get some little nugget into people's heads? Is, if you played around with we that, haven't done that yet. Uh, it's a good idea. I think we should think about that. I mean, one of the things we have a large audience engagement team, and mm -hmm. we do need to think about when we're doing major projects, how are they, uh, how are we make alerting people to what's in that project and getting them uh, finding points of entry. So right. yeah, I think it's a good idea. If you look at a media outlet as an information processing system, then things like Donald Trump timing communications to dominate the news cycle starts looking like a denial of service attack. And things like Pizzagate start looking like a man in the middle attack. Have y'all thought about any kinds of procedural changes to make media outlets more secure against these kinds of manipulations? Hmm. <laughs> Trying to pro I'm trying to information process that one myself. So, in other um, words, are you, are you gonna, is, is Jeff going to buy Twitter so he can shut it down? No. Uh, not, <laughs> I, I have no idea what Jeff is going to do. He doesn't tell me what he's going to do. So, uh, but I, I, that, I, I think that's hi about. highly unlikely. Uh, look, I mean, we do have every politician uh, wants to manipulate the media. And not just politicians, but companies and individuals and everybody out there is trying to manipulate, manipulate us in one fashion or another. Uh, this president has certainly used the early morning hours uh, and the, and the uh, evening hours and, I don't know, all hours uh, to put out tweets. You know, there was a, a lot of the suggestions at the beginning were you should just ignore these tweets, right? Pretend they didn't happen. The problem is that it turns out uh, that we, and we didn't ignore them because guess what? They were coming from the president-elect and then the president. Uh, so we thought maybe they actually have meaning. And it turns out they actually are declarations of his policy. They are, uh, they are reflections of what he really thinks and what's going to appear in policy. So we should be paying attention to these tweets and we should not be ignoring them. And uh, we obviously want to put them in context. We want to do more reporting around them. Uh, but I don't think that we can ignore them. Um, now, that covering these, covering these things, these um, denial of service attacks, as you might call them, um, that's not the end of the line. There's a lot more work for us to do, and we do that work. So the investigations, the fact checking, uh, the exploring the impact on ordinary people, which is of, of surpassing importance, those are things that we, that we do all the time. So um, I don't know that we can, um, he is the President of the United States. Uh, he is the, he does hold the top position in the most powerful country on earth. Uh, I don't think that we can, uh, it's gonna be pretty hard to, and I don't think we should be shutting down uh, that source of, uh, of uh, information or whatever it is. Uh, and we have to cover it and then we have to put context around it. So the uh, the brand of the post and the mainstream media in general is uh, you know these sort of elite old institutions that kind of lean left, which I mean I don't have a problem with. I read you guys; I'm a big fan. But I'm curious if, from a branding perspective, you feel like that there's a vacuum in the conservative media for uh, voters to you know turn to outlets that they trust. And since there aren't as many reputable conservative outlets, you know most voters turn towards Fox. And so I'm curious if you think that, you know, maybe like you guys could partner or some sort of somehow help new organizations spring up to, you know, provide uh, news to these people that isn't just from your editorial page, from you know a right-leaning source. 
Well, look, I mean, I, I don't know that we can create some sort of spinoff uh, for them. I mean, we try to, we try to provide um, uh, trustworthy, verifiable uh, news in our, in, on our site and on our pages and on various platforms. That's what we do. Um, I think that um, there are news organizations that they trust, as you point out, Fox. They trust Fox a lot. Uh, Breitbart has come up, and that's actually posing a competitive challenge to Fox. Uh, and so I don't know how much room there is. And I don't think that it's our job to sort of try to pander in any way to any group, as I said before. I don't think that, um, we, that we should do that in order to sort of um, create a business for ourselves. We have a business today that, uh, where we think that we are in a very honorable, honest, uh, straightforward way uh, trying to gather information to verify that information and then to present it in a, in a uh, unvarnished way to, the, to the, the American public and to the public of the world. Uh, and that's what we're committed to and that's what we're going to do. We know, I know, that we are not going to make everybody happy all of the time. That is just not possible. Um, we would be absolute mush if we tried to do that. Uh, and uh, so we're not going to get everybody. But we do actually, over the course of a month, you know, when, given that we've surpassed 100 million unique visitors in the month, we're reaching at about, in any month, we're reaching about a third of the US population, adult population, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, so uh, I think it's more than Fox, actually. So. Uh, and it's more than most news outlets. Uh, we come in on a bit under CNN, and sometimes we pass the New York Times, but most of the time they're a little bit ahead of us. So we're, we're up there and growing, and uh, we would hope that by doing what we think we ought to be doing, that we would just reach more people. And we believe in, we believe in our independence. Uh, any changes from the uh, Jeff Bezos acquisition of the Washington Post? Uh, yeah, uh, quite, a <laughs> quite a few. Um, uh, look, he came in, he changed our strategy immediately. We were a paper that defined its mission as being for and about Washington, so largely regional, with a recognition that within our region was the capital of the United States. So, uh, and he said, look, I think we should, be, it should be a national strategy and even an international strategy. He said, you know, the internet has beaten up this business really badly over the years. It's taken away a lot of things our security, things like that. Uh, but it also offers gifts. Uh, and the primary gift that it offers is free distribution. Um, and why would we not take advantage of its gifts if we're going to suffer uh, from the things that it's taken away from us? Uh, and here we had that opportunity. We were the Washington Post. It was a well-known well -known brand that has, hadn't actually exploited that, that brand on a national scale or even an international scale. And when you think about internationally, when people talk about the United States, they often substitute as a synonym Washington. So there were great opportunities for that. Uh, on top of that, I think uh, Jeff, uh, first of all, he brought, I would say he brought two main things. He brought obviously financial capital, which we needed in order to experiment in the way that I think was, is necessary in the current environment. And a lot of people have just focused on that. Uh, but he also brought intellectual capital. He brought new ideas and a new way of thinking, which we sorely need in this business. Uh, and it was not just a knowledge of technology and the internet, which is very important, and he obviously has a sophisticated understanding of that, but a knowledge of consumer behavior. Uh, we happen to be a consumer-facing business, and he has a big consumer business, and it's really helpful to have somebody who has that kind of, uh, that kind of experience. Uh, he also forced, he pushed us, I should say, to, um, to embrace the, not just adapt to the internet, but actually embrace what it is. So uh, that involved a lot of things, these new forms of storytelling that we're doing, greater use of aggregation when appropriate, um, uh, a sort of uh, a greater rigor of thinking about what, um, uh, what kind of initiatives we undertake. Uh, I remember our first meeting with him, and he was like, well, what are the parameters that for our idea? He asked for our ideas, and he said, well, what were the parameters you used? And you know, our very limp answer was, uh, well, we just thought they were good ideas. And, um, um, and he, we basically said, well, what will appeal to a national audience? And frankly, what might appeal to a younger audience? Because if we don't have a younger audience uh, in the future, we're not going to have any audience in the future. And he was somebody who thought very long term. So that was, that was really important. Um, and so I think across the spectrum, he, and also he, I mean, our investments, the investments that were made were in, 
I would say, two primary areas. One was the editorial work that we do, the, our news coverage, uh, and the other, uh, a journalistic work that we do, and the other was technology, that we really needed to uh, be leaders in technology, uh, which I think we have become. We've been consistently rated in the last several years as among the most innovative companies uh, media companies in the world. Um, and I think if you talk to the people you, many of you have dealt with, I think it's a, pretty, it's a pretty impressive crew. We are actually now selling our technology to other, other media companies. So uh, he's really emphasized that. A greater use of data, uh, like we talked about, sort of how we might use that, it's really important. We are becoming much more of a technology business than we ever were in the past. In fact, if, and if we are not leaders in technology, I don't believe that we will, uh, we will thrive or even survive. And so uh, he's put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, and, and I would add, and this is, I mean, certainly this was true of our previous ownership, which everybody revered. The Graham family ran the Washington Post brilliantly uh, for the 80 years in which uh, that, that family uh, owned us. Uh, but the time came where things had changed and we really did need new ideas and we did need capital. And, and so, and Jeff is incredibly committed to, um, to our mission, our mission of uh, holding uh, government accountable. Uh, and he says all the time, in democracy dies in darkness. Uh, we need to uh, shine a light in dark corners, uh, things like that. Uh, he believes in that very firmly. He's, he's talked about that very eloquently. And he has lived up to that mission uh, every day that he has owned us. And that's a pretty fabulous end, though I actually am tempted to ask the audience one question before you depart. How many of you are subscribers of the Washington Post today? Excellent. How many of you subscribed in the last three months? Very right. good. How many of you are going to go home and subscribe? <laughs> <laughs> There's some really good deals out there for those of you. Who are not. Very good introductory deals. Well, so. Marty, I, I thank you usually for coming and spending the time with us. Um, uh, it's, I know it's been beneficial to us, and uh, it has been an excellent partnership with The Post, and I, I look forward to that. But most importantly, uh, thank you for doing what you're doing at such an extraordinary time. Great. Thank you.